No, I played terrible for 11 games, but I did win the chuck raffle. That's not mine. We are live. Welcome to Eccles. I'm Ivan. You think they'd have learned from Friday when I managed to fall off a stage not to give me a chair with wheels, but... <laughs> Where were you Friday? Oh, thank you. Newcastle. Newcastle? Yes. It was great fun. Yeah, I like it. Did you the telephone? I think you'll Is it something you said? Three oh, people have just walked out. <laughs> We, we are live. Not very technically. That's okay. It, it's it's only it, we're, we're live on YouTube. Welcome to Eccles. I'm, I'm very excited. I need to find out because if I say Salford's in Manchester, people get upset. Yeah. So if I say Eccles is in Salford, is that okay? Yeah. 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 Right. Oh, you know, well, that's, that's good. How many Salford fans now? Do Salford fans like us? I thought they didn't like us. Who's us? Well, not, not yeah, you. Don't, don't tower us all with the same brush. Yeah. Just, just me. Um, Play to the crowd. If you've ne uh, does anyone watch our programme, listen to it? One person, brilliant. Occasionally. Occasionally. We are 4020 Live. The off Where's the magazine, Phil? Have you not, you not brought a load of magazines? You just run over Don't them. run away. Here's one they prepared earlier. This is like the massively... I mean... Trevor Hunt here, experienced broadcaster, celebrating 100 years of the BBC today. No, I've not. I've, I've <laughs> <laughs> not all 100 I've, years, I've anyway. Of course, I've done 37, but not 100. But yeah, yeah. BBC celebrates 100 years of uh, of the BBC today. Actually, it's yeah, birthday. Yeah. This isn't the BBC because this Jack's been there for 100 years. <laughs> Something like that. They're in uh, Media City, we're in Apple. There you go. So this is the magazine. We are the offshoot of. Do get them. Off shoot. Seamless. There you go. Is that your article? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the alleged host, Richard Shaw, Phil Kaplan, editor of Fortune's Engineering Magazine. Can't even say the words now. Great, former Great Britain coach. Super oh, League coach. Of me the for a minute, huh? No, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't really need to in introduce Brian Noble, do I? Especially not in Salford. No. TV's Danny Caprim from. BBC One, BBC Two, Channel Four, Sky Sports, <laughs> YouTube. What about my playing? Playing for, play for yeah. England in the World Cup. Oh, well done. Yeah. Yes. I mean, Pundit of the Year nominee. Is Always not one in our hearts. Yeah, it is, yeah. Oh, well done. Thanks. It's yeah, on the 1st well of November. Well. A big swanky event in London. Just got the menu. I'm not sure I'm posh enough to go. <laughs> What's on it? <laughs> the start is asparagus and artichoke choked tart. <laughs> what? Wow. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Is, is, is no lasagna you, on is there a lasagna I think Uber on? Eats in London's really good, so I'll just get McDonald's like that. No lasagna, because <laughs> obviously in, in the Rugby League press box, lasagna is the staple food. No, it's duck confit and pea and mint, pearl barley risotto. Artichoke and. Mm. Are you sure you're not on match this year? Artichoke and. Asparagus. I don't think I've had either of those two ever. See, this is this is what happens when rugby league gets to posh places. We don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> we have no idea whether we want it or whether we'll eat it. So but we will complain about it. Yeah. I'm not complaining. No. I'm just slightly nervous that I might have to pre-eat. Yeah. <laughs> no, no pies. No. Dessert. These are the important questions. Some chocolate. There's one of them sphere things, I think, you know, that melts when you pour on the chocolate on the top. Oh, no, I love them. It's been hours in that place. <laughs> yes. Oh, chocolate fountain. That's what I found out this morning anyway, so I've got my official invite through. And obviously you're in the Yorkshire Post at the weekend. Didn't mention, no mention of us again. Every article, no mention of us. You've got to tell these journalists. What would you like to say for the next one? <laughs> it was all thanks to them. <laughs> not, not, not Tanya Arnold at the BBC, not, not Adam Hills, none of them people. It was all it was on me and Phil. No problem. I will amend my uh, speech for next time. And, and Trevor Hunt, uh, 37 years at the BBC. Yeah, 37 years at the BBC, uh, a long time. Uh, sixth World Cup, umpteen different places around the world. So I'd like to think that uh, back in 92, I went over to uh, Fiji to sort out the Bala Tour for 1994 because Fiji weren't playing international rugby league at that time and so we went over in 1994 and we'd like to think that what we've got today with Fiji in the in the World Cup is uh, some part played by Bala and the other lads who were on the tour so it's a long long time isn't it in coming Fiji but here they are yeah. and we're all looking forward to watching them again we enjoy watching them 
and the, the singing they bring beforehand and the rugby and everything else and it's all part of what the World Cup's about isn't it with Samoa, Tonga and the rest absolutely fabulous yeah. uh, the, uh, the hymn has been stuck in my head since uh, Saturday night Steve Mascot is here you, Hello. You've just arrived. Oh, there I am. Yeah, yeah. M62, I'm just learning. <laughs> <laughs> not, not only is this a live podcast, but it also doubles. Is this another one of your book launches? Well, I actually did a Salford book launch oh. before the England Fiji game, and no one showed up, so I thought it's an opportunity for a do over. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got, I bought the books in. But uh, yeah, I've, I've learned that I don't think you allow. I don't think half an hour is enough, is it? You don't allow to be half an hour late, you've got to allow to be an hour late. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm slowly starting to get to know my way around yeah. I've been north. here all my life and that was the first time I've been early today so all right. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're a sport that is supposed to do the M62 <laughs> corridor so how can you get lost when you come in corridor is one a, a really charitable other. description of <laughs> <that>. <laughs> there were parts of it today that were a corridor it's just a congested <laughs> corridor <laughs> the, the World Cup has started and I think on this panel we're all positive about it and hopefully you are as well and you at home Brian what's been your highlight of the, the World Cup so far Pick up on what Trevor said about the the starts to I think most people are attracted to either the Sippy Tau or the Hacker or indeed the Fijian Hallelujah song. I think that gets people into the stadiums but the talent on show is fabulous. Even last night watching Greece I'm thinking the full back chip chasing and playing what they see, it's just as a football nut as I am. I like to see different things. I'm not a system man in any way, shape or form. And so the, so the highlight is getting everybody here when it's been delayed for 12 months. And I think um, the actual games sell themselves. I haven't seen it. I've seen every game so far. And I've not, not enjoyed any one of them. Um, so I think it's the, the standard of football. And, and once we recognise that you know, there are some teams out there that are, that are new, Jamaica particularly. Um, who would have thought the Cedars would have gone so well against the Kiwis? Um, Greece last night against France, many people thought France would. Uh, but there are going to come times when we, we get a cricket score somewhere, especially in Australia. But, and I think we all have to remember and, and beat on the drum that, well, they have to start somewhere. And if we're spreading the, our gospel, which we all try to do all over the world. I actually went to Jamaica for two weeks and um, the amount of talent playing over there would surprise everybody whether they ever convert that into a meaningful competition or a meaningful entity I don't know because we're predominantly seeing expats aren't we so Richard your your long answer to the short (laughs) question that you asked is I'm enjoying it all long answers are better than long questions (laughs) Danica what have you enjoyed most about the World Cup so far no, it finally started. I think. Um, uh, I think uh, much like uh, Brian, it's just for me. It's it, everyone loves an. Well, I love an underdog. Don't I? So Jamaica, the Greece, even Lebanon to it. Like I want, and then in the women's game is going to be Brazil. So a lot of for me, it's a lot of the nations just coming forward, and, and we're expecting yeah big scores. But actually, so far we've had big scores, but we've not had the scores. You know, Jamaica, New Zealand at the weekend could be different. That could be the turning point for the. 100 pointer but you know Jamaica going out they were happy with two points they scored their first points in the World Cup so for me it's just it's just getting started I just like I love I just love World Cup I love sports and there's nothing better than a World Cup and getting to turn on your TV every night pretty much and seeing seeing some rugby league it's nice isn't it yeah. <laughs> nice. you didn't have to watch gives you something to do doesn't it I mean because I, I end up watching all kinds of rubbish like old people playing snooker at midnight on one of the channels I don't know why I'm doing that well I don't watch soaps I don't watch particularly watch TV well, you don't need to watch the Ultimate Women's Rugby, do you? <laughs> what? <Okay. laughs> I'm just saying I don't watch EastEnders and Emmerdale and such like. So actually now I can sit, I've got an excuse to sit down in front of my TV at the end of the day. If you're a big fan of underdogs, why didn't you come and sign for Wakefield when I tried to get you? About 300 times. Because my ego's too big for that, for my playing. You, you know. can follow Brian. <laughs> you know, you say, I like silverware, I just like supporting an underdog. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no shame. <laughs> I won sign for Wakefield right at the very end of my career as an assistant coach and I went there and I don't think Wakefield fans have ever forgiven me so you did right not to go. I was terrible for 11 games, terrible. And I was there, I was only there as a coach but they had no players so I said yeah I'll put my hands up. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, nothing. Gaslight, yeah. 
<laughs> oh yeah, Ka Marwan does. He still likes me, believe it or not, even oh, though right. we fell out. I think he does anyway. Category one license. Yeah. yeah. That's got to excite Marwan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Those three words. Uh, Trevor, what's <laughs> been your highlight so far? Well, I went to the first game at Newcastle, obviously, and we've waited a long time for it. And now, like a lot of English fans, I think I was apprehensive about how it will turn out. You know, if we got beat by a couple of points and we were close, that'd be fantastic. If we won, even better. If we got if we got well beaten, it would be dreadful, wouldn't it? Anyway, what did we do? We ran in uh, ten tries. We were fantastic. And we played really well and some more they can say they were undercooked and everything else but we blew them away and then afterwards as is my want i went on a little bit of an exhibition uh, ex expedition <laughs> should i say <laughs> not an exhibition expedition. Expedition. <laughs> i was an expedition i think we saw those bars later. on saturday night for yeah. yeah yeah i went i went to one or two of the pubs uh further afield in the city center basically where i thought you know there would be less of the rowdyism that sometimes goes with after events and I found lots of um, Geordies and so, quite a few of them had the shirts on, England shirts, scarves and I thought they were like northern fans but they weren't, they were Geordies and they'd been to the game for the first time, really enjoyed it, bought themselves shirts and scarves just to support England and they were really really in love with what they'd seen, albeit on that night and a couple of pints and everything else but I really thought for me that was the highlight because I went to Newcastle I've been to Newcastle before and when you go around the pubs in the city centre you see more of the same don't you you see Holford <coughs> shirts Hull shirts Bradford the lot but when I was on the outskirts the Geordie accents were there they were picking me up because obviously mine is uh, were drunk. English yeah well there was that as well <laughs> 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 off the ground uh, there was that as well but you know that was for me it because I just thought well this has arrived because people outside of the heartlands are taking taking notice and nobody mentioned the ticket prices <laughs> nobody nobody at all mentioned the ticket prices I'm sure, I'm sure, we'll, so I'm sure we'll come back to that yeah, yeah. Steve well, you know what? I kind of had a. You don't have to ask him a question. You just go. No, no, okay. Steve, well, Steve, you know, go. Why would you ask them one question and then ask me well, a different I might one? Do. You might. Do. Okay. What, what are you going to? No, what's your highlight of the world? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, ha I kind of had a pr an answer in my in mind for this, and it was and it was just seeing people, you know, catching up with people from all around the world, and particularly uh, someone who's an expat Aussie, you know. Uh, seeing you know my old drinking mate Brad Walter over yeah. here, and also having a chat to Trent Robertson, and, and, and you know the the gear steward from Toronto Wolfpack was there last night. Um, Simon. 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 Yeah. So, but just seeing familiar faces and everything like that. And but then I talked to the two try scorers last night, and I spoke to Satini Tokolo. That's who I've got this. I was checking this. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, well, one guy, one guy came up to me and said, and just started talking to me. He started being interviewed. He stood in front of me <laughs> and he said, yeah. And I said, yeah. He just looked at me like this. And I'm like, uh, okay. Um, what well, great result tonight. What was it? You know, he said, oh, it's wonderful. It's a very historic moment. And I said, uh, and, um, uh, and, and what was the best moment for you? He goes, well, I didn't play. <laughs> um, I gave you a clue. <laughs> and I said, okay. Where did you uh, learn your rugby league? And he goes, Rhodes. And I went, oh, not not like near Homebush in Sydney. Yeah, Rhodes, yeah. as yeah. in the Colossus of. Yeah. And um, anyway, so a guy just demanded to be interviewed last night. But that. So that was a great moment. That's not a familiar face. And then I spoke to both the try scorers. And Satini said, I said, oh, you know, you scored the first try for Greece. He said, that's the first time I've played against adults. I've never played against adults <laughs> before. And he, only, he could only play in the tournament um, because... He um, turned 18 last week, wow. so he gave up his 18th birthday. And I said, "You, you missed, you know, um, um, spending your 18th birthday with your family and friends." And he said, "This is my family now, you know." Oh, so it was, so it was, um, it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 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 so so I would say that um, all the whole. It's not just the old familiar faces and me being a middle-aged guy who wants to see people <laughs> from home. It's actually all the things around rugby league, you know, all mm -hmm. of it, and and why it's been such a good job over the years, you know. I'm actually getting emotional about it. It was such a fantastic night last yeah. night. To extend from that, before you ask me, because I'm going to jump in anyway. Fair actually, enough. <laughs> the answer is Siobhan Bailey, um, which is probably not a familiar name to, to most. Um, I'd certainly never heard of him, uh, but he played for Jamaica on Sunday um, against Ireland. He is one of six players who've come over from the Duhaney Park Red Sharks in Kingston, played the full 80 minutes, wasn't expected to in the second row, got the honour of interviewing him afterwards talking about the experience and the first thing that struck you was his accent and it's not in any way wishing to um, detract from, from the guy and what he did but it was the most glorious Kingston accent and it was 
quiet and it was quite a long drawn out drawl as he spoke and hearing him talk about he's a teacher in Kingston um, I think he's, he's late 20s early 30s and he's come over and made such an impression with the Jamaican squad that they felt they, they could pick him and they were only going to put him on for about 30 minutes and he made such an impression while he was on there that they couldn't bring him off and when he talked about what he'd been through afterwards and how he's going to take this experience back to the island and enthuse all the students that he teaches and the players that he plays with, you suddenly thought, actually, it doesn't matter what the results are in the World Cup, this is what it's all about. That, that's my highlight. Thank you for asking. Second. Until we get to the bit where we say, oh, England. Well, we've... England! Brian Noble, you had a long playing career, but in your playing career and coaching career, indeed, yeah. In the time you coached Great Britain, we didn't have a World Cup. In the time you played, the World Cup was a mess of a thing. When you look at these events, do you think, God, I wish I'd have played something like that? I wish I'd have played and coached in events like that. With something similar, so there was always a format that either a Six Nations or Five Nations or, or something that was equally challenging. I think the World Cup's more of a level playing field. If, if the draw goes your way, everybody's a chance I think with with the smaller sided the thing for Great Britain as it was then which is essentially England although there'll be some Welshmen and Scots people and Irish people contacting <coughs> me after this one is the fact that the international game needed their three best teams to be on a platform to show the worth of international football and the only way that that could be achieved even in 2006 when we went down under the Kiwis and the Aussies had a couple of games before we got there, so they had more of a rest within there. We to fly to the Southern Hemisphere, we to play five games on the bounce to be very, very successful. So it was indeed, I, I likened it to the probably the biggest challenge in professional sport in the world then. And I don't detract from that. I think it was a tough gig, especially when you played some of the disadvantages where you played 30% more games than your opposition in a season. Um, the travel criteria and then playing week going from Australia for, for people that somebody just got stuck on the M62 <laughs> corridor today and were whinging and pissing and moaning as best as they can but the reality for us was to go to Australia then to New Zealand to Australia sorry whichever way around New Zealand Australia New Zealand back to New Zealand and those are a life changing and player changing dynamics that you have to come to terms with and so it was a tough challenge, but the group that we took in 2006, I, I still think was extremely as well prepared as it could have been and, and provided some highlights there. The fact that we probably ran out of juice wasn't a surprise to me. But getting back to the World Cup, absolutely I would have loved to either played in one or indeed coached in one. Um, it would be one of the things, international football, that I'd probably drag myself out of bed for now you know, and, and get committed to again. I think it's international football I'm a big fan of. If you look domestically where I've coached, South Wales ended up being North Wales in the same season. So there was a dynamics there uh, over in Toronto. Uh, so I'm, I'm an expansionist at heart and, and a growth person. It's hard for me to call it expansion, it's growth. Uh, and to take you up on Steve's point, I bump into people, I've got friends in Toronto and friends all over the world that they see what I see, they understand that genuinely, and it sounds corny sometimes, we're involved in the greatest game of all, both from the player's point of view, what, whatever format it takes. Uh, and, and we're just, it's still sometimes in some parts of the world, other than the eastern seaboard of Australia, it's still the biggest kept secret in the world and it frustrates the life out of me because it's a magnificent, magnificent spectacle and the people particularly, again picking up on what Steve says, I just love the people. Danica, you played in the World Cup in 2017, which was, a, I don't know, would it be fair to say it was a bit of a secret tournament over here, I don't think as much of it was televised. Um, I mean, I've seen you in the film. <laughs> if you've not seen Power and Mary, you should go see it, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, it wasn't so much of a secret tournament in the sense that Women's Rugby League has literally taken off over the last four years. So th there was there were games on, like the first game we played against uh, Papua New Guinea was on at 7.30 in the morning, on whatever channel or red button or whatever. And not just on here. the Women's Rugby League bandwagon by that point, you see. So. No, 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 no. It, it's, but when over in Australia, on the flip side of that, it was 
as big as the men's so we were put on Fox or whatever the equivalent whatever it was out there all all of the games not just the Australia ones um, and we played our pool games were three games a day so they dedicated a whole day of essentially rugby league you know we did all the TV stuff we did all of the media work when we were out there so actually out there it was the first time I felt like a professional player because we, we rocked up and yeah we flew on the Friday night we landed Sunday morning we played Wednesday afternoon <laughs> so it was a very quick turnaround and then we played Sunday so we played Wednesday, Sunday no Thursday, Sunday Wednesday, Sunday um, so it was a tight turnaround but at that time I say that time it's only five years ago but then it was such a massive thing that we'd been flown out we'd been given this lovely hotel we'd been given everything we needed in terms of medical and everything like that and and all of the media and the support that actually you felt like a professional player and despite the turnaround being very difficult on the bodies especially the older ones that of us that were out there um it was an incredible incredible experience and you know we only had six half day training sessions before we went out so to say that we went out and came essentially third in the world cup i'd take that jealous might be the wrong word envious might be the right one how do you feel about i'm horrendously jealous <laughs> i don't care yeah well great now these girls have had two years they've trained nearly every weekend they've been in camps they've been out to australia and papua new guinea in 2019 to prepare um you know they're they're having top notch they're now getting participation fees the same as the men to be in the world cup which i took five weeks off and paid it, it's not a sacrifice it was a choice i made you know i could have just said no i'm not going i made that choice to go out and do that but i think it's fantastic for the women that are now playing and um, that they get all of that the turnaround time is a little bit a little bit more get an extra day i think in terms of <laughs> of games but they've had they're in the best possible position in terms of training and and care that they could have and they go into camp on the 28th the evening of the 28th so actually they don't have much time in camp together i know the australians have just got together now they they're together for a week before they fly so i think the turnarounds in terms of everyone flying and then playing is going to be quite as tight uh, quite tight still but yeah i'd love to uh, mm, now let me word this properly i'd love to be in the position that the girls are in in terms of the playing and the fees and the kind of things that they get now but i'm not so bothered about playing now that i'm older and <laughs> it hurts a bit more if if England could win the World Cup, would you? I mean, they can't win the World Cup, of course. But would that change your mind about being older? And, you know? No, I'm really ha really happy for the girls. That you know, the props in my position now, are fantastic. So I'm under no illusion that I'm old and done. <laughs> <laughs> I still want to. I think you'll always want to, won't you? That never go away. No, that never goes away. <laughs> so never leaves you. Uh, I still dream of playing for Lee Miners. Yeah. <laughs> I they dream it. of you having. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, the nightmares for them. <laughs> uh, dream for me. That was it. Being the Masters World Cup. To <coughs> well, yeah, I've been invited, but I've never been able to make it. Um, you know, my particular Silton skills are perhaps uh, a little bit too delicate for <laughs> Masters rugby at the moment. I've had my new knee, though. I've had a new knee. And nobody told me, get a new knee, you'll be sorted. So. Perhaps this is the time. The, com the comeback is on. The uh, comeback is on. What, what are your favourite memories of World Cups past? Obviously, as you mentioned, six World Cups you've covered. Uh, yeah, plenty. Uh, first one I did was 1995, which was over here. I did it with a guy called Peter Ward, who did uh, a lot of radio leads. And he was a real character. And um, you picked up your tickets at Wembley for the very first game. I think it was England, Australia, up at Wembley. You picked up your tickets. And Peter was old school colonial the way he talked. So he was, hello, Trella, are you and I are going to have a go at this? And, we'll, and so he's a lot different to me, really. And uh, so we get there and we're queuing up for ages to get our tickets. And the guy who's handing them out says, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the person in front line, he, he doesn't seem to have a ticket. And Peter says, well, in that case, you should go to the back of the queue. And he said, no, well, no, it'll only take me two minutes. He went, I'll time you then. <laughs> and he stood like that and he waited for his ticket. He came back. So the next game, we're up at Hull playing some game at Hull. And I get there and Peter's over at Leeds because they were split. So we were doing for Radio Kalang, which is Papua New Guinea, we was doing for um, Radio Australia and we we're doing Radio New Zealand as well as doing stuff for BBC mm -hmm. and things. So we're really extremely busy. Mm -hmm. But we get the next one and the guy says, he sees me come up and then he's going through his tickets like this and in the end he says, I can't find Peter's ticket, I can't find it. I said, you're okay, he's over at Leeds. So that it led him off. Well then I did PNG and on this one, 
I'll finish with this one, but basically PNG, I went and interviewed various players after they played over at St Helens and what have you. And I did all the interviews and then I go to send them back to Radio Kalang. And I said to Is Peter... Is that a real name? For yeah, it's called Radio Kalang. Radio yeah. Kalang. Yeah, and I said, awesome. Peter, I said, I've got all this bloody stuff from uh, PNG. I can't understand the single word they've said. He said, don't worry, when they play it out there, they won't understand your questions. <laughs> <laughs> so that was it, 1995 World Cup. Episode. How many times have you been here? Well, before you moved here, Steve, how many times did you come over and cover the Kangaroos? Well, I, I, I came over on all the, all the tours starting in 1994. So the last big one I missed was the 92 Challenge uh, World Cup final at Wembley. Um, um, Steve Raniff beating John Deborah. And then, and then after that, I went to 1995, uh, 2000, uh, 2008, 2013, 2017. And on each occasion, went to as many games as I could. So I, I didn't... I mean, I think now I would be in trouble if I was covering the Australian team on this tour and I'd gone to um, uh, gone to Doncaster last night, I'd get a boot up the backside from my boss. What are you doing doing that? But, but I managed to get away with it. Um, and I've got, there's heaps, there's heaps, there's, there's just so many, so many memories. I mean, like I, I remember that Fiji, everything was, so in 1995, all the teams had been basically taken up rugby league because... Uh, Colin Love had invited them to the sevens, and suddenly they got invited to a third in a side. So no one had seen South Africa and Fiji play rugby league before, and it's ju- it was just the look of astonishment on the Speckies' faces when they walked into Keefley and saw Fiji play um, South Africa. It was and you know the and the kickoff being delayed at Central Park for England and Fiji, and and um, you know. Uh, very late nights uh, in the Queen's Hotel with the Aussie team in, in 2000 and fire alarms going off and cra- just, just yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess my favourite my favorite memory though would be, would be, it sounds weird, but seeing South Africa play Fiji at Keefley, it was just a revelation to everybody was, who was there. And I remember I got a vote on Man of the Match, I might have got the only one. And, and Brian will know that um, it's a toss-up, the reaction you get for when you're picking man of the match. We picked the man of the match, it was Mike Pio Nakumbo or something like that. And the whole crowd cheered, and I thought, it was, this is the greatest day of my life. I mean, <laughs> they think I'm a good judge. And no, no one's thought that since. So, so uh, yeah, it was a fa- fantastic, um, yeah, I, yeah, just been great memories. And I, just the driving. I mean, one time, before Satnavs, um, I decided I was going, and when Souths were getting kicked out of the competition, or re- yeah, kicked out of the competition in 2000, I tried to go to every game, and I, I actually got the gig covering it for Reuters. But I didn't have a car, so I was getting lifts from everyone, and Reuters want copies straight away, you know. So I'm like um, asking to stop at service, Dave Hadfield, and stop at services, and anyway, um, I decided I was gonna go to the, um, the, the, the um, Lebanon game by, uh, from Leeds, where the Australians were based, uh, by a, like the most direct route on the map. Not a motorway, <laughs> the most direct route on the map. So I went to Hereford where they invented cows, but I wasn't supposed to go to Hereford. Um, and it, I went all, I went all the way. Australian education wants yeah. a bit, don't it? I was yeah. invented in Hereford. But um, but I got I got all the way to South Wales. The game was over. I stopped in a motorway and I went straight straight back to Leeds. And when I got back, I think South had been kicked out of the comp. So, uh, so yeah, that oh, that would be the stupidest memory. But I've, yeah, there's a thousand. Sorry, I answered that too yeah. long. Sorry. <laughs> keep sp- keep speaking. Says me having to think of a question to ask. <laughs> uh, just on, on that, just when he was mentioning Hadfield, the late great Hadfield is a friend of all of us here. Journalist who passed away earlier this year. And you mentioned that you know, you kind of implied driving. Well, Dave Hadfield, Dave didn't he drive. could not drive, but he worked for the Independent. And he had a car allowance. And he had a car allowance because once they rang him up to see where his copy was and he said he'd left his keys in the porch. And therefore they said in the porch. So he, he got a car allowance from the independent for his car, which he couldn't drive and he didn't have one anyway. Well that was it. Well, that the, Northern Acts. We can, the story can now be told. <laughs> Just going back to that Fiji um, South Africa game, I, I was there as well. Um, and there was a women's game on beforehand, which was interesting, because uh, we think it's a, a modern development, but actually it was being played you know, 30 wow. odd years ago. The thing that strikes me about that day, and you're absolutely right to bring it up because it opens the eyes of people, mm. is that the coach of Fiji was Graham Murray, mm. and that was the first time we'd ever come across Graham Murray, and to be in his presence when he did the post-match analysis was like a different level. Mm. You know, with, with the greatest respect to the coaches that we interviewed on the British game, 
Graham Murray was on a, you know, was different, and the way he analysed it and talked about it was different. The passion that he had for Fiji that day was different. But it was also, I think, the first time we'd heard the South African national anthem since it became the Rainbow Nation. Oh, right, so yeah. all of that as well was was just really emotional, and, and only World Cups can do that, which is why they are so exciting. I can remember as a fan, um, which would probably tell you how old I am, going to the World Cup final in 1970 at Headingley. Um, was only uh, nine at the time, so I don't really remember a lot about the game, other than I was told. You're Trevor like Benjamin Button, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was told by my dad, who took me, that. Great Britain were going to win the World Cup because they'd beaten Australia in the group stage and so we just had to turn up and watch Great Britain win and they'd lift the cup and as a, as a kid you know that's what in, inspires you and makes you want to be a fan of sport and it was the most horrendous game uh, it's known as the Battle of Leeds looking back on it um, I think there were two players sent off one of them after the full time whistle went was John Atkinson who was a policeman never got sent off but headbutted somebody after the game had finished it was it was such a brawl that even the national press which never really commented on rugby league had headlines the daily mirror i think said thugby league this sport should be banned and it breaks your heart as a 9 year old kid but you become inspired by it's a world cup and all of these green and golds and kiwis and and even the png when they started coming over getting the chance to see them play once every four years or see names that now we take for granted because you can watch an NRL game every week but then you probably have to wait for the video to come in a week later and then go and hire it and then put it on and see these iconic colours and players and then they were playing on your pitch and you just thought that that's why international rugby has a dimension beyond club rugby league and World Cups just inspire you as a spectator or a player. I mean, I mean, it was good to see the Australians play, wasn't it, for the first time in 700? World ranked number four men's Australia. Is that the yeah. uh, uh, official word? Sean Wayne is the coach of England, and he led them to a 60 points to six win over Samoa on Saturday. We, apparently, we'd written, we'd written England off. Oh, did you write them off, Steve? Was it you? I wrote off England. No, yeah, I didn't. you did. I think I, I said. I, I, I think I said. You did or not? I think what I said is they are favourites for this game, but I think they'll lose. So. I was wrong at both gets probably because <laughs> Sean Wayne was upset. You know, apparently, people had people had written off England. Mm. No, he wasn't upset with people like us. It was the other journalists. <laughs> it's, 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 oh, right. it it's a call to here. arms. It's a rallying call. You're always I've got a bad reputation. You. You're always looking for a theme, <coughs> aren't you? The you truth is, you don't know until they're out there. That's the that's the reality. As a coach, what I did like about what Sean Wayne said was the way that he recognised that we have good players mm. as well. And you've got to remember, eight and nine of those players have played at the highest level in the, the National Rugby League in Australia and done well and been good players. So he, he certainly has the belief that I always have our best players as good as Australia's or anybody's best players. And recognising the fact that he had a good team and his defensive stand on that, it can get you back up, but that's your job. That's your job to say, was, well, yeah, I understand what's coming against us, but do they understand what's going against them? And that's the reality. You don't know until you get into the tournament as to where you're going, who's going to stay on the planet, who's going to perform well. I thought the team at the weekend did everything, everything that was asked of them. And all the the jewels and sparkles that, that we see in our team week in, week out, like Wellsby finding right pass selections for different things. The introduction of Victor Adley, I thought, really added to the spine of the team. Sam Tompkins, um, Williams, Wellsby, fluid, Question marks over all of those, of all of the players and his selections go away. The introduction of Herbie Farmer, who I know quite well from, from different connections, and Dominic Young, those that watch the National Rugby League every week, understand that you have to pick them. Because I suppose the challenge is people don't want you to pick if they think there's something equivalent in our country. But I also throw in there the introduction of Andy Ackers, the Solver player. Absolutely, thoroughly deserved. You have to pick form players, and he's done that as well as Wayne. So we can all be critical. We can all say they're going to play a certain way, but I thoroughly enjoyed the performance at the weekend. But come, come quarter final, semi final chat, it'll be a different yeah. challenge from now on in. I thought it was a classic, though, like coach kind of mind game is before a big game, you need a rallying call, and you're looking for one everywhere. And you can bet if all the players recited after they win, 
that it's been used to G them up. It's not, it's not accidental. They haven't all read the same story and independently come to the conclusion that we're being underrated. Someone stood in the in the mm. briefing room and said, look at, the, look at this, you know, and, and, and I guess it worked. And now I don't think they probably need to do that for the next two pool games. Maybe for the semi, Wayney, and the final, he'll come up with another one. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not sure it's as big as that, Steve. I'm not sure it's as big as that, because I genuinely believe that he feels he's got a good team, because I think he's got a good team. We all do, the way that before. The, the good thing for me was the fact that they were clinical. Mm. Normally you see an England team make a few more errors than they did. Yeah. I think the only error I saw the whole of the game was the Welsby intercept. Mm. And that was on the verge of it. Had he got that right, it was another try, another score. I think the biggest story is the... The, uh, <coughs> I don't know what to call this, the Samoan performance because they had it nine in our grand good. final. Yeah, not very good. That's what I mean. Like, I thought they were pulling through the, through the towel in. Mm. But they Samoa didn't play as well as we expected. No. Like you know, all of the the stuff that was out about with Samoa. I've got eight grand finalists. Rah 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 rah. And like Brian said, we've got what 10, 11 people that have either played or are currently in the NRL. But, yeah, clinical performance, really well done, England. Great score, exactly what he needed, but how poor were Samoa? Yeah, well, that's always the argument, isn't it? You know, are you playing well because the opposition's playing poorly? Are the opposition playing poorly because you're playing well? And it's a chicken and egg situation, isn't it? Well, first 30 oh, minutes was tough. I thought yeah, it was a good yeah. work. Well, there was only matter, three errors in that first half, and, <laughs> and, and even less from England in the second. So if, if you kind of look at the stats, for me, they opened up uh, in such... The, the mindset looked right. The first tackles are the ones that you witness, don't you? Are you driven back or do you drive them back? And it almost shows your mindset. From us in the terraces, I and mean, you were on the bench watching it, Danica, you were playing in these. That kind of, to me, sets the platform for what goes thereafter. And right from the first exchanges, we were in there getting on top. And mm. I, I just thought we played exceptionally well. They were disappointing. But, you know, a point that sometimes I think most fire players is. No Liam Farrell, no Johnny Lomax, no this, no that, no the other. Hold on, I've been selected, yeah. so am I only a second choice? I'm as good as him on my day. That's what you must think, mustn't you? And at the end of it all, I think that might have contributed to uh, the way it was, because lots of lots of pun punters said, well, this England team, they've not got this, not got him, not got the him. You know, by the time they finished, we were really not, even Lewis Dodd, who's not played all season, as to he, how much stronger they would have been in, with him in the side. I think that gives you a, a, besiege, um, a siege mentality mm. that helps you take on the opposition. And if I was in there, that would have been something I'd have been drawing well, on. I think, I think you think can play that siege mentality once, and I think he played it perfectly. And all this were being written off. That's yeah. a great line, but you can only do it once. I think now that they've shown their hand, that won't I think wash. his biggest struggle now is selection, isn't it? Well, the, the interesting, interesting thing for me, which summed up... From. Probably the greatest success that Sean had was George Williams, mm. who I think, by his own admission, has not had the greatest season at Warrington. His, his stats are still pretty good, but he has looked like he was playing an unfamiliar brand of rugby this year that he hadn't quite come to terms with all the people around him, weren't giving him the ammunition he needed to be the best he could. You then put him back into a Sean Wayne system where he understands exactly what's expected of him, takes on the mantle of responsibility that he clearly likes, and he, for me, he was the man of the match. Mm. Um, and I know that uh, obviously everybody's got their opinion on who perhaps it should have been or who officially it was. Radley was superb, but I just thought Williams controlled that game. You can tell why Victor Radley gets knocked out all the time, can't you? The way he was getting for tackles. <laughs> yeah. That's what you want, a body on the line. Head I think on the interestingly, other just pitch. to go back to Sean, I think tactically he got it absolutely right. All week, I was banging on to the people that jumped into, you've got to go at their middle because their strength was Pahalihi and Paolo and all of these big fellas. But their weakness, sometimes their strength is their weakness and their engines and their tanks needed juicing out. And I thought the outside backs particularly and the middle blokes, I thought he got it bang on. Because the game didn't really crack open until 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah. And so you well, got to, to do that, you've got to take the juice out of them. Yeah. Watkins try probably uh, turned it. Made in Salford. Made in Salford. Made in Salford. And of course, then you get Matt Parrish, of course, who was coach. Uh, Ex Salford. Uh, uh, Salford. Well, six games. Six games, one no, win, no. and then I went to interview him, and he had been told he was on a flight back, they thought. They weren't even sure. So, <laughs> you know, that was Matt at, at the time. But, you know, Matt, 
he looked shell shocked in the press conference after he was asked about the six tries in the last 16 minutes he had no answers for anything he didn't know what to say it was right back from the mic so whatever he was saying you couldn't really hear it it was one of the uh, toughest press conferences I've heard a, a coach not answer to in, in all my time he really didn't have any anything to say did he Phil? Oh. Nothing. Is, that, is that the funniest piece of advice I was ever given? Steve will know this. I played under Jack, Jack Gibson and Ron Massey at Cronulla in '85 and a little bit of '86, and kept in touch with Jack Gibson when I started my coaching career. And just on the fact that they didn't know what to say, <laughs> I, was to, I can't remember what it was at Bradford. It was some difficult situation with the chairman, and publicly it was out there. And I rang him and I said, "Jack, I don't know what to say." And he just went, "Well, don't say anything. We'll put the phone down." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say anything. That's good. Better nice. give them nothing, take them nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, two things. I'll come back to the team selection in a moment because I'm intrigued as a coach how you select these things. But going into a press conference after a game like that, where you know the team's been heavily beaten, how do you face up to you know <laughs> the reality that your team's lost in a World Cup opener in front of a global audience by 54 points? Not that they've caught you, but have been that same situation, but similar situations in the past. How do you go out there and try and sell positivity well you protect your players first and foremost that's your role and you give the press some things that they might be able to hang the hat on but you don't give them too much you just put your hands up where you have to if something's blatantly gone wrong you have to put your hands up otherwise they sense you're a fraud if you've done something fundamentally wrong that's cost you a game you say well i think we did that wrong but you try not to highlight any individual if somebody gets somebody gets hammered on there's a certain piece of footage that blames one person and so well, I'm sure he wouldn't want to do that again and I'm confident that he won't do that again and, and then it becomes a selection issue afterwards as to who you pick and why you pick them and whether you think they can change the things that they've done or you pick somebody else in that position so I think that, that would be my criteria if, you, if you've had a shit day at the office there's no point saying that it's all roses and flowers but you protect everybody as best you possibly can and get ready for the next one Wayne was always more critical after a win than after a loss. After a loss, he jumped to their defence. And after a win, when everyone wanted to talk them up, he took them down. Don't ask Wayne Bennett how excited you are for the World Club Champions. That was a, that was a, that was a really bad question of mine. Um, and a prickly interview followed, which was, was good fun. Good, good learning experience. You're always learning. Always learning. Oh, you could have asked Every him. Every school day. You could have asked him what he, he thought about uh, the re reenactment that Great Ralph. Oh, Great Britain were coming back into the world. What did you feel about that? And he said, no idea, I'm an Aussie. Or worse than that. <laughs> so, uh, we sold a few more shirts, that's so. made a few, Made a few pounds for the RFL. Um, the, the question I was about to ask was about how you select an international team because you've got t players from different clubs and different egos and whatever, but you've also got a group of players who you know and trust, but then you're picking players on form as well who you may not know. How, how do you integrate the the two? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. Um, I can only probably explain how I tried to do it with the coaching staff. So I had great coaching. We used to meet every Wednesday in the season, every Wednesday religiously, which is hard because all the coaches were full time. Dave Lyon, John Sharp, the conditioner was in there, what they could imagine. And we first and foremost analysed what the statistician said so you looked at what the form book said who can make the metres who's making the tackles who's on paper given the form so you, you, you have a paper sift and uh, and then you talk about all your own particular favourites and you keep that particular squad you also look at people that are out of form that have been in the inter international for whatever reason been in the international circuit before but and you know what kind of job they can do on an international front you look at combinations for different clubs, you look at halfback combinations for clubs because the more fluidity you have without having to be overtly coaching the team helps you. Um, so it's, it's a really, really thorough process and it was probably... And then you get to the end of the season and somebody pops their head up like Andy Ackers did in the last 10, mm -hmm. ten games of the season, you think, well, you've got to pick him because he's on form because you have to pick your form players as well irrespective of what you think so you you literally have to take your coaching hat off and you put your international hat on and you say right what's best for the team here and then you've got to look at whether people can complement each other you do background checks on their character are they good for a group can they spend long long time together uh, in camp 
uh, and how you manage those kind of things. So all the things that, that people don't see, it, it doesn't happen the night before where you think, well, I think he's a good bloke, I'm picking him, he can play. It's, it's, it was never done on reputation in, in my system. I'm confident that the systems are still the same and they're still as thorough. Um, so it, it really is a meticulous and then you got you got the old adage that you think somebody can win you a game, or you think somebody can save you a game, and you think, well, do we take a chance? He's not playing well. Can he can he actually grow and be a part of, of an international team? And that's some of the risks that you take. You might have one or two there that people scratch their head and think, well, why has he picked him, or why has he picked her? Or so it, it's a really really thorough process. It's not mix and match. It's not it's not like on a coupon, and you think. It's not fantasy form team, it's you have to see and they have to be able to play the way that you want them to play as well. So you have to pick, pick players that complement your style of play or whoever you're going to come against. You're picking playing against Samoa, Fiji, they're, they're absolutely huge physical athletic people so you have to understand that you've got to match them somewhere or at least have a have the ability to negate what their prowess is and how you think you're going to exploit what they're good at or exploit or get behind the scenes so it, it's massively involved in the selection process because at the end of the day you have to put a group of people together that like each other and want to have a dig you know they'll run hard tackle hard adage so it's yeah it's very very thorough it's only not just on a cigarette pack no, <laughs> Frank Myler at Great Britain was my first Great Britain coach. He generally used to pick the team on a fag packet, <laughs> and he didn't. He didn't know Wayne Proctor was there till the fourth week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that fella there. He's turned up to every practice session on all you lot of morning. Says so that's Wayne Proctor. He says I knew he had one missing. <laughs> <laughs> and then picked him for the next two games. What was your background check of? Would you, you have had a positive report from coaches? Yeah. Well, try hard. Leave. <laughs> Not always. <laughs> Leading up to the World Cup, uh, Chris Chapman was my England coach at the time, and regardless of whether he'd been at the game or not, and he used to try and get round to as many games as possibly could, because he was independent of any club. Uh, and every Sunday, without fail, you'd have to text him something that had gone well and something that uh, that hadn't, and then you'd have to analyse both. And then when he got the footage, he would then message you back and say, "Oh, you were spot on," or "Are you sure about that? Look at this time, this time." And then he tried his best off his own back. We probably had a one-to-one -one session with him every three weeks, but based on the league that we were having, because obviously we didn't have any international fixtures. Um, and then 2017, we went out to France in the June, and um, we knew that basically was, for us, it was World Cup selection time. And I remember getting my first starting shirt in the first test, and I was like, all right, cool, I've got my first start for, for England. This is a good, got about 65 minutes in the first game, and I was like, sweet. And the second game, he put me left me on at, at prop for the whole second half, having played probably 25 minutes of the first half. And I walked off and he went, what have you got left now? I, I nearly cried. And I was like, absolutely not. It was 36 degrees as well in the south of France. And I was like, absolutely enough. And he was like, no, I can tell, really well done. And I was like, is that it? Is that it? I've left everything. I was nearly crying. I, was, I had to crawl off the pitch. I'd put everything into it. And I was like, is that it? And then that night... He had to leave early because he was um, he works for Sport Coach UK or something. But he had to go do some table tennis World Cup, and he just texted me saying, "Can't continue playing your season like that, and you're going to be in the World Cup squad." And that was the best. I think I screenshotted and framed it because he never gave you any compliments. He'd, he'd give you like feedback and say, "Right, you ran hard here," but it was always a but. And he was always looking at those tiny one percent as it was never marginal, huge, huge gains that he wanted to make. It wasn't huge gains, sorry. It was like these tiny marginal one percent things, and he was like use your right knee more or, and I was like what do you mean use my right knee then we'd watch footage and I never used to use my right knee to get up and he was like bring your knee up and then get, you'll get up quicker and it was this tiny little so you never really knew how good or how bad you were doing you always knew you had something to work on but getting that text from him to say keep playing like that in your little cup was probably the highlight of my life <laughs> <laughs> and then I went and sat my, my ACL Until today. Uh, obviously I was going to say but then a, a week later we came to a satellite session and I tore my ACL <laughs> <laughs> but now you're on the cool. telly and everything, you, you know, you're famous. You, no, you're no, no, not famous. But you, do you get any social media grief? Because obviously, not only are you on the telly talking about sport, but you're a woman talking about sport on the telly. I'm a woman but, talking uh, about a men's sport. And indeed. I, <laughs> but, I mean, but that's three things. Mm, yeah, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there's plenty out there. Luckily, I don't follow much of it. You know, some people send me stuff or copy me and stuff. And I just, do you know what? If you take everything to heart that you read, 
Like, I wore a green blazer for the Challenge Cup final for the women in May, and somebody was like, why should I trying to be Fiona? And I was like, is that really what you've got? You want me to look like Shrek and Fiona? So if you looked at all of that stuff, like, literally anybody's... And the, the guys, and it is the men that are bothered that I'm not in the kitchen washing and cooking, then bless you. It's cute. Because what I'm doing is I'm a much better job. People can't see me nodding, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, what I'm doing is a much better job than you. Like keyboard warriors are my favourite people. Those of them that sit at home on the sofa watching and telling us that they can do a better job than Sean, they can they can run harder than Victor Radley, or they'd have a better outcome than anything else. And congratulations, I'd love to have as big an ego as you do. Mine's pretty big. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but if I read them all, yeah, then you might get down. But you've got to listen. I've I've not asked to be employed by the BBC or Sky Sports or Channel Four. They keep on wanting me back, and so as long as, as I'm watching rugby and getting paid for it, then I'm going to keep doing it. And that's as, as fickle as it might sound. I'm really loving being able to watch rugby league alongside loads of fantastic people in fantastic venues and get my hair, my hair and makeup done every time I turn up. What woman doesn't want Brian that? Likes that? I actually. like that bit best. Yeah, I was saying that. I said that early, didn't I? Yeah, that's one of my yeah. highlights. Yeah. Genuinely, is one of the highlights. And then somebody walks around going, "Do you want a tea? Do you want a coffee? Do you want a sandwich?" And I'm like. I'm watching rugby from a prime position. I'm getting paid. I'm made, made to look better. Mm. I'm being fed and watered. <laughs> Who cares if you don't like what I've got to say? I, half the time, I think I don't like what I've got to say, but I'm saying <laughs> it and it's coming out. So here we go straight to Trevor. 37 years at the BBC on the radio. We don't get none of this on the radio, do we? We're, we're like the second class citizen, third class citizen. Well, well let's be fair, uh, uh, and you can answer this. Why would I need makeup on the radio? <laughs> uh, well, you could That's say good point, you do need makeup. Thirty-seven you know, years, you've nailed well. it. Yeah, it's, um, you look it's, great it's well. Thanks very much, but that's because you used, used to looking at a radio dial, aren't you? So that's that's where it is. I just close my eyes and pretend. Yeah. And but imagine. the thing the thing is that you've always got to remember it's better being a has been than an her been. Mm. That's the way of it. And you know you do see that many a time with people who are like the same. How, how long do you play rugby? When did you play? And all the rest of it. And they'll say, Oh, well, I, I packed up when I was sixteen. I packed mm. up when I was seventeen. You're like, Well, actually, you might have been good then, but you've never kind of carried on. You. The thing is to try to put yourself on the line. Now, I only played amateur, um, obviously, but I did play like nearly 350, 360 games at various levels. And that, you know, you, it's not that easy. And there are loads better players than me, so I'm not saying I were a good one, but I, w I had longevity, let's put it that way. You don't need to be a serial killer to do the police round. At the uh, yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 really, I really think that, you know, like, like you're saying, Daddy, it's, it's, it's fantastic. You, you put all the effort in, you get the reward. Yeah. The one thing I did notice that everything you said you would do, you know, you enjoyed most. It was like almost being a man. Yeah. Somebody waiting on us, hand and foot. You know, all right, not having our makeup done, but our shirts pressed and all the rest of it. You've got to be careful on who you are on this line. We were talking about that before. You'll be kicked yeah. out of the rugby league media sisterhood. We is want to in. The, is, is there such one? a thing? I'm, is told, I'm, told, I'm told there is. I'm I want to be part of that then. I mean, I don't know. I didn't know <laughs> I was we, can be, we can be allies. Yeah. We can be allies. Yeah, but it's one of them things. Sounds isn't like a really bad indie band. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really hey, I'm really the lead singer. Yeah. I'm the lead singer. You don't watch him. Can you sing? No, I, you can dance. We know this. No, I mean I, I can sing in my car <laughs> and in my shower. Yeah, my, I'm Celine Dion. <laughs> Behind closed doors. That's a good Fiona thing. Was. When you said Fiona, I didn't understand that. Shrek and Fiona. Ah, I wore oh, Shrek. Oh, I wore right, a, yeah, yeah. a gro green blazer that ah, was yeah. similar to this. Right, right. And the one bit of feedback I got was. I was like, do you know what? We won't want to be Fiona at a Disney princess. Mm. I wish you'd not ask that question now. Take that one out. No, <laughs> well, I've Trevor. Well, I've. Yeah, well, but yeah, people people don't like it. But do you know if you don't like it, switch it off or turn it off. But you want to watch rugby, so if you want to watch rugby, you got to watch me. I'm lucky. You played loads of games. Charles <laughs> played loads of games. Brian's played loads of games. How many games did you play for? Six. 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 Steve. And what left foot? <laughs> Windang oh. under sevens. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, the last game I played would have been the. Uh, Illawarra High School knockout when I was like eight, uh, seven, eight, 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 eight. Oh, well. maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, they, they oh, organised. Yeah, I haven't included those. Yeah, they, seven. Are they first class? They no, count, you're right. You're right. The they actually had a media cup, a journalist cup in uh, in Sydney, and John Quayle and Ken Alfson organised, and they all went, came along and used to stand outside and laugh at us, you know. Exactly. Uh, but Was I'm, anybody sober? Uh, yes, actually, yeah. Um, uh, what's I going to say? Uh, Peter Fitzsimons, he said he's only played rugby league twice. And he's been taken hospital both times, and one of them was in the in the journalist cup. So that would have been the last time I played. That would have been in the nineties. So I, I haven't counted my appearances. I don't too know. many. <laughs> too many to count. More appearances Big than tackles. That's for sure for me. We have spoken about England 
Australia, Steve, they're back. The world's number four team. Back like playing, you mean? <laughs> um, back playing yeah, no, I, was, I thought I was. I, that to me was Fiji's best ever performance mm. against Australia. I looked at the, I looked at the margins, and it's not their closest. I think thirty-two is their closest margin, and it was thirty-four. Well, thirty. Anyway, no. yeah, thirty-four. So, but I thought I thought they just never looked completely, you know, overwhelmed. You know, and with with some of those players, you know, like Api Corosau and 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 Viliami Kiko, I just thought they they don't look overwhelmed and. Someone said the other day Australia's uh, um, um, uh, aura is gone, which is a popular kind of thing to say. It's kind of a, a, bit, a bit of an empty thing to say. But the the, the place where it has sort of some um, veracity is just the fact that they're playing now against a whole bunch of guys who play against them every week. So if you get an aura from not, sort of not knowing someone and being intimidated by them from a distance, that distance is gone now. So even last night, um, Laurent Fraser knew it's like, uh, you know, a lot of people watched that. They would have thought, well, uh, it's disappointing to only beat uh, Greece by 34-12. And he went, well, look at their spine. Lachlan, Ilias, Pete, Mamazelas. He said they've got their spine. They've got NRL players. Good players. And so he's, he's like, um, we were pleased that we stuck to our, our task last night. So the whole competition, even though we still have those great stories we've been talking about, about guys who... They've never played against adults before, or they raised in Rhodes, or they're from uh, uh, Kingston. Equally, we've got um, f- the familiarity that we couldn't have dreamt of in 1995, right. where oh. the guys know each other. You, oh, you know, the, um, the two well, most disparate well, teams of this yeah. tournament would be Jamaica and Australia, I guess, as far as who knows each other. Mm-hmm. And you'd still get half a dozen on either side hugging each other, at, you know, sending each other texts during the week. It's just a smaller world generally, and I think the World Cup sort of reflects mm-hmm. that. That, did, that didn't answer your question at all. Well, it doesn't matter. Oh, well, well, we it, talk about Australia. You want me to talk about Australia? I talk well, about Australia. Well, we don't, I, I just think at the time, <laughs> I, I didn't realise we didn't have as much time as I thought, but it, when we get to the, the latter stage of the competition, this is something I mentioned with Kyle Amo, who's our guest on Thursday. When you guys finish, I have to stand here and talk for another 15 minutes because I was late. Is that right? Yeah. You've got to show your books. That'll be easy. You'll do it easy. That's a Steve, what's your book about? But we're talking about Greece and Jamaica and, and Ireland and whatever and these stories now, but when we get to the final four, we will be talking a lot about Australia and New Zealand. That's their time to shine. This is everyone else's time to shine almost at this point. Yeah, yeah. it is. And, and I guess that's the, that's the thing that people sort of, who haven't been to many matches, seem to be struggling to get their heads around that um, they, they, they go, well, why is it the ground full? Or, you know, um, why was that? Why was why was the standard seem to be lower than what I'm used to if I'm watching NRL and Super League? And I think if you go to a match, you'll kind of get your head around it. That it is, it there's something different. There's there's a different vibe at a World Cup as far as it it doesn't feel kind of as cutthroat. It feels more, and I think it's because if I if if I go out to a, if I go uh, back out to Australia and um, and I run into a bunch of my mates. Uh, we'll go to the pub. It's great to see you. But if we, if I go to a wedding in Ireland and people have come from everywhere, it's a completely different vibe. You know what I mean? It's like I, it's like every second person I see, I know, and I, some of them I can't quite place. And so there's that kind of carnival um, celebration vibe at the games, and maybe it doesn't translate so well on TV. And someone goes, someone goes, oh, the score was too big, or the the seats were empty. And I, I think you've got to really kind of. Yeah, uh, sort of uh, become involved in, in in the event socially and be mm. present mm. to actually appreciate that it has things that other games don't have. I think I, I've got to, sorry, I've, I've got I've, I've just backed that one up. Uh, all I'm saying is, obviously, I've seen all the complaints about you know, again, are they trolls or whatever they call them on the social media, and how many of them are there? Should, should we take them on or not? I don't think so, really. But if you go to the game, uh, I was at Warrington and Lebanon. If you go to that game, the atmosphere was terrific, absolutely fantastic. And you know, we saw a game where Lebanon surprised everybody, and I'd, I'd never really realised how good a pra- player uh, Mitchell Moses was. You know, absolute <laughs> cracker in, in that game, and some others uh, as well against New Zealand. So you sit at home, you watch on telly, and you watch the telly. I watched the game last night on telly, and I've watched others, but the atmosphere doesn't really come across. You know, you, you get more knowledge because you get the stats and the backgrounds and all that. But the atmosphere doesn't come across. Whereas when you're at the game, it's a fantastic atmosphere. You're part of it. You're living the situation. And when things happen, your peripheral vision gives you aspects of the game over here that the TV camera's focused on. There, it's a whole experience to me. And to me, that's why 
why you should be going on and what you've been. There are some from. basics Sorry. though of no, the no, World no. Cup that I don't think people kind of on social media really understand. They they don't understand that the World Cup is a separate organisation to the Rugby League. That it's got it. No, the RFL to blame for everything. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 that's their fault. We were late on the M62. Yeah, yeah. Rimmer's fault. They don't like someone who works in the media. To me, was surprised when I said that it's got to fund the international game for three or four years. Oh. Hey, what do you mean? No, I, said, I, said, I don't mean pay for test matches. I mean it pays for grassroots around the world. So you've got to generate money. Otherwise, the International Federation doesn't have anything to give to the countries. And that's a basic thing that I don't think has been communicated very well. Because I think people, corporations, companies are shy about talking about money. So they just don't talk about it at all. And, it, and a very important part of this tournament is to raise money so it can be given to countries like Brazil who are, and, and Canada who are now providing teams and they're providing content now to generate more money. So then it can go to you know Thailand or it can go to the Philippines or it can go to you know Belarus, not Belarus, not at the moment, no. Oh, um, yeah. so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And people just don't un kind of understand that. Yeah. And there's some real basic things that I think you don't need to get in an argument with people on social media, but I think you've got to sort of explain some really basic things that people don't understand about this, you know? I, th I think there's two things that come off the back of that. One is we want a strong international federation mm. and it's only going to be strong if it has money. You know, how, how can it dictate to the NRL and the, and the RFL if you're asking people to do things, but economically you're not in a position of power? Mm. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why generating profit from a World Cup is number one. I think we also need to stop being apologists. Mm. And I think this is a, this is a rugby league mm. thing. That, you know, there was a slight glitch in the sound system at Newcastle on Saturday. For those that were there, it didn't spoil anything. No. It was odd for maybe 10 or 15 minutes because yeah. people were looking around going, do we carry on, what do we do? Um, you know, how, do, how does this impact on the health and safety of the situation? But actually, it, did, it didn't spoil anything. But as soon as the Rugby League World Cup organisers, who I think have been brilliant in keeping it going for an extra year amongst anything else, start putting out an apology for it at mm. half time, it has to be reported. You don't need to do that. It's, it's like an admission of guilt, isn't it? Which is yeah, not their no, fault. Be confident. I, I think I think you ask a question, um, you know, what happened, and someone gives you a quote. Here's what happened. This is the power. But, but you don't do it during the game yeah, because it, you know, it like, magnifies you know. it. I but think really, then, by forty minutes into the game, who remember what happened? Well, and it's the same with you know Mick Hogan's been interviewed about ticket sales. You know, you don't have to justify it. The ticket sales that you're getting at the moment are commensurate with every other World Cup that we've had, and you're going to make more money. I think it's important to people to know, though, that you know they've already exceeded 2013 by a million pounds, and they've just gone past 2017 with 59 go or 57 games to go. I think that is a good re repost to people who are saying it costs too much yeah. to get in. What they could fill the place. But, but don't you know do it as I mean? an like, interview you know, because you're then making it a story. But equally, and nobody else was really talking about that other than us yeah. in our in our echo chamber. I, I think you know the other thing that hasn't we're been too mentioned. Well, well, we think we're honest. We, we see no. it and say it as it is, and we're honest about our game. So you can't but, actually accuse us of hiding anything. No, but, but the let's, other, let's but be the honest thing, then. If you were a true rugby league fan. And I can say this because on Saturday night I brought my own ticket to go watch Australia. That's how desperate I was to go you see James. You bought a ticket to watch Australia. Yeah, and it's getting selfies, weren't you? Went, I went my met, God! I met James Tedesco, life made. Just for sure. World Cup? Could, no, I didn't. I, I, I heard that. I think he said he wanted my number, but I didn't know he was married and. <laughs> number ten. Yeah, he, he yeah, said. That's a great one. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> that's good, Fred. <laughs> well done, Fred. But <laughs> equally, I went. I went last minute, bought a ticket, and I paid for whatever because I did. But. If you're a rugby league fan, do you know a year ago, do you know six months ago, there were deals on tickets. The tickets were cheaper. We were out there, they were selling offers, they were doing family offers. They were so if you're a rugby league fan who is whinging about ticket prices, why did you not get them six months ago? Exactly, that realistic. last minute discounting yeah. is bad yeah. Bad for the sport. Oh no, it's not because you've and got everyone your discount. Thought would, yeah. Everyone thought it would happen because it happens yeah. you know, in, in domestic competition and I think it's good that they've you know, stuck Kept to their guts. To it, yeah. um, well, th there has to be a prestige. £2.21 to take your child last night. has to be prestige oh, about the international £2 game. £2.21, exactly. Yeah. You, c you cannot pay the same as you do for a Super League game, for an international game. You have to make that differentiation. You, your competition has to be prestigious. But I think the other thing that, that has been missed about all of the ticket prices and the attendances, particularly at games, is this is the first time every game has been on television, mm. uh, on mainstream all television. All 61, all yeah. live on the BBC. So, 
if that is available to you as a consumer that sounded like an advert <laughs> I've been trained up there very well you can't do ads <laughs> on the BBC yeah. but you can do ads about the about BBC the training also. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so in, in the past if you wanted to go to a game you had to go otherwise you wouldn't see it now yeah. you can say the attendances aren't very good, but I can sit. I mean, I mean, it. one of the. I mean, it would, let's not. I mean, go into people on Twitter. But someone said, "Oh, do, if the stands are going to be empty, don't put it on TV." Hello, it's 2022. <laughs> that's what sport is. It's what's on TV. Yeah. That's what they sell. That's how the players get paid. That's how the, the stadium gets rented. That that is all there is. If it's not on TV, it isn't on. You know, it, it doesn't exist in 2022. But then the person that's saying that <laughs> is watching it from the TV, and if we didn't put it on TV, would then be whinging. Yeah. So, like, why is it on the channel I have to pay for? Yeah. However, do you know what? Tonga and PNG is on BBC Three tonight. FYI, everybody. Are you on it? Where no. is BBC? Where is BBC Three? Somewhere on the next to BBC the Two and. I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I don't know. As long as, got, as long as when you're looking for the red button, you don't go too far back into the night. I think mean, you'll be all right. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. You know what Phil is saying about sort of corporate speak and <coughs> putting out an apology and. It is. I didn't think it was so bad. They put out. I, I, I kind of it jarred with me that everyone said exactly the same line. Mm. You know, they all said exactly the same thing, and there wasn't that natural kind of. But I, th I can understand if you've been involved in planning a World Cup for all this time, and something like that goes wrong. It really, it really hits you. You know, you get really upset, and you imagine everyone else is more upset yes. than they are. You know, so um, you know, there's a balance to be to be struck. I guess. For going so long, they didn't have a cockroach on the top of it when we started this World Cup process, and now it's back. Uh, before I don't ask everyone who's going to win the World Cup because that's a terrible question to end with. Any questions from the audience? Well, of which there are people here. I mean, you, you can't see this. Unlike myself, a book <laughs> <laughs> 24 man squads. Do you think that's big enough? 24 man squad? Too not enough? Too many? Good question. <laughs> Injury suspension. I just yeah. I think with the vagaries of potential suspensions but it seems to me that international football has a, a little bit more leeway and a bit more allowance as to who gets hit around the head and who doesn't <laughs> uh, and I'm all for that because the least the referees blow their whistle the better the games are if you've not reflected upon that so I think 24 men women I don't know how many is in the disabled uh, 12 um, yeah I think it's enough I think if you were talking about going overseas I never thought 20, it was 24 for the Great Britain teams that we used to take for 6 or 7 years that was never enough I'd have taken 403 48 because of the travel vagaries and that made it difficult but with it I think 24 is enough yeah where do we go from after the World Cup we've got France in 2025 what are we going to do for not just the Great question. four nations but the emerging nations as well all very well seen, Greece are fantastic now. What are we going to like in Great 2025? Question. Where's the competition? Where's the international football? Oh, we're going to play the combined nations again this year, aren't we? Now we're playing France. Oh, good. Oh, can, I, can I make a point before France. you answer that, Phil? Phil's in a good position, probably Steve's. I think we've got to get a grip of our international schedule. I think we've spent a long time not having one. And part of that is the strength of the NRL is club football over there is number one. And international football is number two. Sorry, or, Origin is number one <coughs> in the NRL, and then international football. We've got to get back to a place where we can find a window where the Aussies will play because I want to see the Australia, the number one team in the world, mm -hmm. and we can find meaningful tours and international fixtures that we can buy into, including all of the the, the nations that are coming into this now, and, and make it meaningful. I think. We took a step towards it with the Pacific Nations Cup down also, which I think has illuminated. I think the difference in Australia and their view, it might not be the actual national team of Australia, but is that the, the heritage players and Tonga particularly and Fiji and Papua New Guinea and the amount of money that the NRL has invested in their feeder clubs for, for these things to grow, I think they're on the verge of having something, if not as special as Origin, remember in Origin is what the live and die for the number one TV show in Australia I think we've got to bring the Australians to the party and they make a meaningful contribution to international football i.e. commit to some tours commit to this that and the other and we have to plan it's a brilliant question we have to plan international football because I think it's the next <coughs> best telly, telly selly time I think broadcasters want to see it I think fans want to see it see and I think I think we need to encourage the, 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 you know, you can the International the, Federation needs to have a whole lot more money than it's got. You can see the difference that the media, different ways media treat international football. 
We never used that qualifiers for World Cups. You know, mm -hmm. you just got invited. So mm -hmm. this is the first Women's World Cup that had qualifiers. Mm -hmm. Qualifiers. So that's a massive, you know, step forward. You know, um, but I believe, you know, up in Newcastle, they, you know, the International Federation had their congress late last week, and there's still a lot of disagreement about the international calendar. And there's two big camps, and, and we've been promised an international calendar for how long now? Phil, you know the background. Uh, we've been promised a 10-year calendar for the last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a difficult, isn't it? The, the seasons don't quite run in line with each other. Like but they're going to. And yeah, I, th I think the two things to mention is IMG seem to see what we're talking about, and they have prioritised an international element, and they are bringing the parties to the table. The qualifier thing is really interesting because the advantage of having only three years between this and the next World Cup is that the qualifiers will kick in in 2023. There will be the first African nations at the next World Cup and their qualifiers are already set. Um, I think the European Championship and a Euro B for the developing nations is also set. Um, it's not set in the round in that everybody is agreeing. It. It's done through the European Federation. but. There is a willingness that this World Cup is bringing to the table that International Rugby League has to take precedence. It's got to be an incentive yeah. players, young players in particular. Well, and, and, and again, it's not a criticism, but rather than announcing the fixtures for Magic Weekend at Newcastle in the middle of a World Cup, which I understand from a marketing point of view, what we should be doing is saying there's an Ashes tour on next year and the first game is being played at St James's Park and you can... If you Except that decision hasn't been made. I mean, exactly. But the thing is like one step forward, two steps back. I mean, we were very happy four years ago when we had standalone Origin on a weekend which meant the, internet, the guys who weren't Origin players could uh, play for their country in Australia. Well, some of them chose to play for their country instead of Origin which, you know, and, and some of them wanted to play Origin and then play for the other countries. And then they found the ratings weren't as good. So the, the ratings weren't as good on a Sunday as they are on a Wednesday night. So now they've scrapped it. It's gone again next year. So Tonga, Tonga Samoa, Fiji, um, PNG, they cannot play mid-season now because they've scrapped it because to get better ratings for Origin. Um, so we, we, we always look for things that kind of change and stay changed in, in rugby league. And, and, and it seems like 75% of things change and then change back. And it's that 25%, those things that stay changed. And I think all these matches on the BBC, I mean, Andy Wilson texted me last night. He said, if you, you went to the 1995 Merging Nations, um, you know, which we all went to, this watched by 200 people or whatever, and uh, the Russians were selling their jerseys behind the state, behind the grandstand after the matches, you know. And then, and now to see, um, you know, uh, Greece and France on the BBC live, they're the things that stay changed. They're the things that have changed and will stay changed. We're not going to go back to behind the grandstand with the Russians vlogging there. You know, that, that has stay changed and, and they're the things we have to look out for, you know. Yeah, and well, these are two different levels. Obviously, you're talking top edge, chill, and if you're talking the bottom level, and I've got to go back to my own experience, which is way back in 1990, go to the Cook Islands, Tonga and Samoa with Bala, and then Fiji in 92 to set up the next tour, and then those three nations and, and Fiji again. You've got to, to my mind, if you start sending out community international teams, which are, they can go and play on these islands, in these areas, and then help to develop international at the right level. Because, you know, when they're playing top amateur players, they're still quite good players, and they're still too difficult for uh, domestic competitions, but it gives them some yardstick to go against. South Africa did it in 1995, as over well, there twice, uh, to get them in that World Cup, and again in 2000. And that's where we don't utilise it. The amateur players are expected to pay for themselves. If the international competition put money aside to send these groups of top line amateur players, community players, then you'll get something to set them on the road to actually in 10, 15 years it might be, or in two or three years, depending on how quickly it can develop, to actually play other nations and, and then part of the qualifying. But it's that long-term goal in at a short-term gain and, and the combination. And like you said, they're all arguing at the top table, aren't they? Because they all want the money, either for the top stars or to be in amongst the top stars right at the start. And isn't this reflective of what we have from League One into Super League? Everybody wants to be at the top table. Nobody wants to earn the places there. Any more questions? 
Well, Isn't it about time we move set of rules? Move the car and come back for rugby league. Sorry, say that again. Sorry. Isn't it about time we had one set of rules for rugby league <laughs> instead of one in this country, one in Australia, and one for international? And we won't be fans of the captain's challenge. The NRL just see themselves as Formula One, so they don't care what anyone else does. If they want to change the rules from one season to the next and give two points for a, a drop goal from their inside halfway, they'll just do it. They, 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 don't, they, don't feel they, owe, they, owe, they don't feel they owe anyone an explanation for what they do. And in fact, it comes right from the top. It comes from Peter Volandis, people writing letters to the newspaper. He reads it and goes, oh, two-point field goal, six again. That's a good idea. Let's do it next weekend. And I, I just, I just, you, it's down to personalities. You know? But it's down, it's down to money, isn't it? Mm. If the International Rugby League Federation had pots and pots of money, maybe like the Rugby mm. Union do have, then they could uh, dictate to domestic competitions and say, look, you're not getting any of this pot of money unless we have one set of rules. If you had an well, international, we're not strong enough for that. Let's say Peter Volandis is replaced by Andrew oh. Hill or someone, oh. you know, then, then they, he might, his view might be different to Peter Volandis. He might go, well, that's a good idea. Let's get it approved by the International Rules Committee for next year. Mm. But, you know, personalities mm. have an impact as well. I'm just hoping that the mm. Australian yeah. women walk off after 35 minutes. 30. 30. 30. It's 30 each way up there. Is it? Yeah. I'm yeah, yeah which playing, Danny, 40. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, we're proper over it. Like. Yeah, yeah, we play full rules. We play exactly the same as men, same size ball, same size pitch, everything. Yeah. I know it's crazy to think. Oh, yeah, because they, they play with a smaller ball in Australia as well, don't they? Yeah. yeah. Size four. And they play shorter time, so. I mean, uh, you can only cross your fingers and hope and pray that that makes a big mm. effect, but I don't think it will. I think the, the, one <laughs> the weather is our biggest. Uh, a Warrington support. He's there. And I just thought I'd point him out. I, I want to be like Fiona Bruce, gentleman in the brown shirt. It was a less serious question, which is what do you make of the Australian squad numbering system? I mean, I couldn't care less, but it's, it's hilarious how much it's wound people up. It's brilliant. I argued on Twitter that it made no difference and it was a, an interesting thing. And then watching the game, it confused how I on these <laughs> And I've got no idea who anyone is anyway, so it doesn't make any difference to me. Josh Edo Kaka where Apparently, the decision was made two, two years ago. Mm. So it's, no, it's nothing new. And obviously, squad numbers upset people in Australia. You know, they like you to change the numbers every week. But then, if it's in the program on a Wednesday, you've got to wear whatever numbers That's you've right. got on a Wednesday. Um, and so, I guess someone just said, whether it was Michael Hagen, said, well, if they're going to make us do this other thing we don't like, we're going to make it twice as confusing for them. I don't know. I think it's good for, it's good for anybody that doesn't know rugby league or doesn't know, is new to it or is new to some of the teams because Lily, can, you can look at the sheet, can't you? can find out who's who and who's what. But I think from a play point of view, I, I think it's more disappointing from a play point of view. So, if you've grafted and... Let's say I'm a prop and I, I get a starting shirt, I'm number eight, and I play an eight, but my squad number's 14. I've earned a starting shirt and I want that eight, but I've still got to play with 14. I think regardless of what we think... you felt at your last season? No, no, because if, if, you're, if you're 15, you're 15, aren't you? Like, that's what I mean. So it's not as... Yeah, who, who doesn't want to have a 1-13 to 13 shirt? And you can see that the teams that have done it properly, who the 1-13, to 13, who the favourable players are, because they've got the 1-13. to 13. Australia... I quite like the fact that they're just throwing a bomb in there and going, we're going to do what we want. Latrell Mitchell's got number eight. Now, I want Latrell Mitchell's shirt. Not a big fan of um, South Sydney. Not a particularly big fan of his, but I want his shirt now because he's got my number. So it's, it has, it's worked in terms of a viewer or when, a fan's perspective. When we, when we first played with this in 1996, the idea would be like Michael Jordan and you'd have a number yeah. for your whole mm -hmm. career and you'd be able to market yourself as, the, as that number. And you'd change clubs in that yeah. number, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that it, it never quite happened you know it was like we had all we did is we had team selection like once a year instead mm -hmm. of once a week you know um so but if we got rugby, international rugby league back to the halcyon days when when i've recognized so many brilliant number eights for australia i, I can reel them off I, I i'm not a big fan of the squad numbers and, and the way that they've tried to number up it just I sat there and I think, well, it's just typically Australian. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I thought. I said, but they, they would they sit there and go, typical Pommies making us wear squad numbers. We yeah. don't do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? That, so well, you stay so for me, it should be one to seven. And this is the why day. the two rules don't yeah. match up together. <laughs> <laughs> but I can see why they did introduce squad numbers from the Rugby League World Cup point of view, yeah, because yeah. they're trying to appeal to an unfamiliar audience, and you have that number for the entire tournament with the name on the back. So, yeah, we again, I, I get your point. It's, it's being disrespectful. Um, but if over the course of the next five weeks the Troll Mitchell becomes a household name and he's number eight and someone in you know, St Ives recognises that number eight, I want to see him play again because he was good last time. I think it reflects a sort of change in society and popular culture where we used to, with sport, we used to want to know about rules and people's roles and what they do and now it's all about personality. So mm -hmm. the idea that a position you play 
is more important than your name is ridiculous in social media age. Your name is more important than what you do. You know, you can you can be famous for doing nothing, mm -hmm. and I think it kind of reflects that. You know, they, 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 it's more about you and and you being a star than than what you do on the field. That's boring. You're you not know? trading about some kind of <laughs> prim eight logo, like you know, Roger. Frank no, no, but equally right. If you're number twenty four in that squad, do you feel like you've just scraped in? So why can't we just pick one to seventeen on the day, and exactly. then if the number six is Brett Kenny or Wally Lewis, you can say I've got Brett Kenny or Wally Lewis's shirt. That's what I agree. What, it's because he's a number six, or I've got Ray Price's yeah. at number thirteen, or Wayne Pierce at number twelve. Well, this is the shirt the that I've been saying. The irony of jumpers and marketing and merchandising is you can't buy the jumpers. So you can say you can say, oh, Latrell Mitchell's in eight. That's going to be a real collector's item. You can't get one. You can't get one. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd have thought that the most controversial that. topic would be the bloody Australian squad numbers? But it's always. I quite like somebody when somebody throws a spanner in the work, so I quite like it. Mate, <laughs> we'll put our numbers on what we want to put them on, and you'll like it. <laughs> Maybe we can get me the Mitchell shirt though. You must have caught. You're working yeah, for the BBC. What's your number one or number three, Latrell Mitchell? I just you told you, the shirt. only reason I want his shirt is because it says number eight on it. What about you? Because you played that position. Yeah. But you're unique in that respect. Yeah, but I, I'm just telling you, regardless of what, well done Australia, because I now want Latrell Mitchell's <laughs> shirt. <laughs> I cannot stand South Sydney, I'm a Roosters fan. Uh, you must be happy that one of the top Sydney Roosters fans is wearing seven for England then, when that squad that has been announced. Very that's very a whole different. Room. That's a whole different ball game. Talk, start Cotton Winfield Hill. Cotton Winfield Hill. Nozzy's wearing number seven for England. So a lot of the manufacturers, in case people are interested, a lot of the manufacturers have only made enough, like enough jerseys for the for the team. Mm. They haven't even just bothered to put them uh, retail. We go through them. I kind of. We obviously know England are available everywhere. Uh, Ireland, like you can get from O'Neills. Uh, VX3 of doing uh, Wales and Scotland, you can buy them. PNG, none, none for retail at all. Wow. Australia, as far as I know, none for retail at all. Wow. Um, um, B or K are selling um, New Zealand stuff. Uh, Cook Islands, their manufacturer uh, is saying you have to buy it from us. You can't buy it from anyone else. But in fairness, the Cook Islands are fairly small, so I'll give I'll give them the benefit. Of the well, the but I think the I think the manufacturer is in Adelaide, so ah. the, the size of the Cook Islands. What about Fiji? Who were there? Uh, Fiji is um. A, not returning emails. I haven't seen. Because I would so. buy a Fiji shirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not, and I think it's because the, the biggest issue is the sponsorships are done at the last minute. Got so it. everyone goes, "Don't make them! Don't make them! We're going to get a sponsor! We're going to get a sponsor!" And then by the time they make them, there's no time to get them over here. There's no time to make them any 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 uh, numbers. And so, um, um, so it is really. Everyone says, "Oh, the problem with the World Cup is they never get the jerseys made in time to sell at the games," and that's one problem we're not making progress on, sadly. I think we've, we've, we've done. Unless there's anyone else who's got any final questions. Oh, because we'd like a book. You've got to go, go, people, gotta go, go and get the cars. Uh, I'd like a book from Steve. Yeah. If you want to buy Steve's book, he's got his book. What's, what's it called, Steve? What's it about? Two Tribes. It's the third edition. Has it got all the spelling mistakes, haven't it? It's got fewer typos than any previous edition. <laughs> <laughs> I've, got a collector, I've got a first edition collectors now. I'm, 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 I'm well chuffed. Oh, you, uh, is, that, is that your sales pitch? Because I'm saying it's not very good. Come no, on, no, give me no, a real no. one. No, no, it's been well. I've been. It's been. It's been around for a little while. But uh, it's the story of 1997, the only year that there were two competitions in Australia, and the reason we have Super League, the reason the clubs that are around now are around, and the reason the clubs that aren't around now are not around. A uh, hundred, a hundred interviews, uh, including people, obviously, who, sadly, who aren't. Uh, I say obviously because it has been a year, and we're all not getting younger. But uh, um, Bob Fulton, Peter Mulholland. Uh, Morris Lindsay, all interviewed in here, um, and yeah, I'm pretty proud of it. Anyway, so good book. Good book. Good book. Good good it's got no squad number in a. No it it is. This, this, it's about the origins of squad <laughs> numbers in 1996. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about squad. No, numbers. no confusion. <laughs> And what we do in the adverts, so tune in BBC Radio Manchester 95.1 FM, 5 till 6, Rugby League Extra. Myself and Jack Dean, and along with Stacey Copeland. Always so you can have that one as well. Well, I was this just about to ask you. It's, a, it's, it's always a pleasure. To, I mean, I'm, I just want to ask you, where, oh. where's, where's your sidekick? He's in Portugal at the moment. <laughs> Funny enough. It's all right for some, isn't it? Well, okay, well, it is, it is. on the short straw. Um, <laughs> Danica and Brian, you're both on the telly. Have you got anything else you want to promote? On the telly? No, I just uh, think I just think just tune in. Like I think, regardless. I mean, I know I've not said I've not said much about the women's or the wheelchair world cups or the PDRL, but you know, we just haven't we've got time for that. Yeah, don't you worry. Martin Coyne's no, watching. So I think I you know they're mm. live on the BBC, and it's not about selling the BBC; it's about selling the sport. And the more coverage that the sport gets, the better, isn't it? So, BBC Three tonight for the well, which I think is going to be so far the game of the tournament yeah. for me, it, Tonga PNG, and we talk about how small. 
the, the 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 family of rugby league is. You know, you got the likes of Conrad Hurrell and Tui going up against Reese Martin just as a, a as a bare bones. Despite the rest of the fact that that is going to be, I think it's going to be a colossal battle, and I'm really excited to watch it. I mean, we've got to say thanks to Eccles Library for inviting us here today because that means we can go off to St Helens because it doesn't mean we have to go back. Fill the magazines out. It is. Uh, uh, hold with with fill-in charts of each of the competitions, <laughs> and who doesn't want a fill-in chart, let's be honest. So put all the results down and you can plot where each nation's going to be later in the competition. Somewhere blackboard, it's great. Yeah. The, the best TV column, columnist since um, oh. Clive James in there as well. Oh, it's fill-in. Well, it's just your yeah. column, Danny. <laughs> Um, so that's it. Thank you very much for coming. Much appreciated because, seriously, people don't turn up for these things. Uh, but we don't tell them that. So thank you very much for coming. Thanks for spending your time. Take a biscuit. Patronise Steve. And uh, enjoy the rest of the world. Also buy a book. Buy a book. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.